Good evening. Thank you, thank you for tuning in to hear some organ music tonight. We're going to wander around the European continent a little bit. You just heard a piece from Venice, written for St. Mark's Basilica in Venice by Giovanni Gabrielli, who lived in the late 1500s and until about 1612. Uh, that sounds very much like 1500s music. Uh, and you may even have heard that piece because every brass group in the world plays it. So uh, that's, it's out there in those most plays, played tunes. It's a piece called La Spiritata, The Spirited One. I'll play another piece from Italy, and I'm starting in Italy because that's where musical things tended to start over the centuries uh, in Europe. Anytime a new style or fad developed in visual or musical art or theater probably as well, it probably got launched or conceived and first uh, implemented in Italy. So musicians from all over the continent traveled to Italy or imported it Italian artists to them to uh, keep up with the latest styles. Now we have another Italian organ piece from Rome by the great composer Frescobaldi, who was the organist for many years at the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome. This is not one of his more serious pieces. It's called a capriccio. That does, uh, the uh, English translation of that is caprice. It's not something whimsical, really. Uh, capriccio is a rather fluid term that can apply to many different things. Uh, but this is called the capriccio on the cuckoo. And many of you, many of you probably know the cuckoo sound. That's over uh, a period of time, that was the traditional sound for the cuckoo. So I want you to just listen and see if you can count how many times uh, you hear it. And I'd love for someone to tell me because I haven't counted them myself.
There was music going on in Spain at the same time. And I'll share with you a Spanish piece by an anonymous composer, early 17th century. This is a dialogue for the corneta, which is a particular sound. which sounds like this. Well, there are two. There's a big and a small cornet, and they, they uh, alternate. It's an echo piece.
I'm going to move to early England. England in the late 1500s and early 1600s and play you a piece by Peter Phillips. Phillips, like William Byrd and Thomas Tallis, was a Catholic and given the ups and downs of Protestant and Catholic goings-on in England at that time, uh, these Catholic musicians knew how to survive. Uh, when things were okay for the Catholics, they, they could be out there and write music in Latin. And when the Protestants took over, they went inside and wrote quietly and wrote English language anthems and uh, just sort of uh, didn't muddy the waters. Uh, Phillips did get into some trouble and did have to leave England. And as such, he went back to, or went to the continent, uh, went to, to Italy, but also spent a bunch of time in uh, Belgium and uh, even got to Amsterdam. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, this piece is called the Fantasia. It sounds like vocal music by the composers of what we call the Tudor period. Bird, Gibbons, Tallis, the Peter Phillips, uh, except that it's a keyboard piece, so the hands can't keep still, and they keep running all up and down in scales and lots of little trills and fancy stuff because the keyboardist wants to show off what he can do and transform what would sound like a wonderful, uh, more cons uh, normal, uh, traditional vocal piece for a vocal ensemble uh, to make it into a little something of the, the keyboardist's own.
The main reason that Peter Phillips went to Amsterdam was to encounter the great musician named Zvelik, Jan Peterszoon Zvelik, the star musician of Amsterdam over the turn of the century from the 1500s into the 1600s. Uh, Zvelik was at the Oudekerk, the that which means the old church, the biggest church in Amsterdam, and he had a great organ. It's important to understand that. Uh, you've noticed so far everything I've played did not have any part for my feet. I do know how to play the pedals, but the music that I've played so far did not have pedal parts because early Italian organs uh, and early English organs, in fact English organs until pretty much the 19th century, uh, did not have pedals. Uh, Sveling's organ started to have pedals. It didn't have full, uh, it had a full pedal board. It did not have a full range of pedal stops. It was used mostly to play solo voices with the feet. Just as I could bring in, if I were playing an organ piece, bring in a trumpet or an oboe uh, to play a solo line, a uh, simple, slow line that uh, the organ began to be using with a solo stop. I'm not going to play that kind of piece of Sphalinx, but it's important to mention. Uh, this was the beginning of the full flowering of the full pipe organ with several divisions to be played on two or more keyboards and pedal with a full complement of sets of pipes for a full ensemble of different sounds. Uh, Svelink was legendary as a teacher. Uh, a whole generation of German musicians studied with him and began to then fill the posts of all of the important churches in other German cities. Uh, and that lineage goes all the way up to Bach. I'm not actually playing any Bach tonight or any music by Buxtehude, who was the star of the big generation before Bach. But um, it's because of failing that the organ music and the organs themselves developed uh, in what we call the full flowering of the North German organ school. Those of you who were in this church after the fire, so the early years of the 2000s, from about January of 2003 until October of 2007, enjoyed an instrument of that North German tonal school. The instrument by Taylor and Booty from Stanton that, that served our needs before this organ could be built and installed. So, I'm going to play you a short piece by Svelink, a toccata, so it's a piece that shows off how fast and wonderfully the fingers of the player can move on the keys. Um, but even though I've talked a bunch, I'm imagining or hoping that you're going to hear a similarity between this music and what you just heard from Peter Phillips uh, and what you heard in terms of some of, some of the uh, runs and uh, flavor of the uh, music from Italy and, and Spain. This is all very much from the same period of time.
Now I'll bridge the gap uh, in Germany with one piece from the middle of the 1600s. Uh, this is from the city of Lübeck, which uh, is so far up in Germany, it's almost in Denmark, and it's sort of been in a nebulous border area for a long time. Uh, the musician's name is Franz Tunder. Uh, he was born in, I think, 1614, something like that, to 1667. So uh, he died right around the time that, that uh, Svelink, uh, uh he was born, rather, uh, right around the time that, that Svelink died. And uh, Tunder is an important figure because uh, he established a great music program in uh, Lübeck, and an applicant for the position was a young musician named Buxtehude. Uh, it turned out that one of the conditions for getting the job was marrying Tunder's daughter. Uh, well, Buxtehude got the job anyway, but eventually he actually did marry the daughter. Uh, Buxtehude then was influential and uh, someone that Bach traveled to encounter and hear and work with. So um, that just gives you a little idea of the, what I call the geography of organ music, which also is the traveling geography of organists uh, in uh, the European continent. So this is a piece by Franz Tunder. It's called a Preludium, which just means a piece to be played for people. Uh, from, I would guess, the uh, sometime after the middle of the 17th century, the 50s or 60s in the 1600s.
over to France now. The great era of the classical French organs was the last third of the 1600s and the first third or so of the uh, 1700s. Although the organ stayed around, but the music sort of uh, diluted itself a little bit. Um, so I'm going to play you some pieces from a, an organ book uh, by a French organist named Jacques Boivin, who lived from 1649 to 17, six, uh, 1706. Um, the French organs, as I talked about a couple of weeks ago, those of you who heard me talk about the different organ sounds, the French organ pieces were written to show off the different organ sounds. The reed sounds, the flute sounds, the full organ sound, and uh, a few special things like the partials or the tiers. So, um, this is a short suite. It's called, it's in the premier ton, the first tone, and all that means is it's all in the same key. We would call it a sort of D minor. Uh, this had to do because of the, tu the tuning of the organs was not in today's equal temperament, which meant that this black key, sorry, was, depending on how it was tuned, was a G sharp or an A flat, and they weren't the same thing. So if you played in the wrong key and you played some G sharps, they would sound like they were a little out of tune. Uh, some composers wrote that wrote for them on purpose when they wanted an effect. But uh, anyway, these are some pieces by Mr. Boivin. The first one shows off the full organ. The next one shows off uh, a little bit of a reed stop, uh, and it's going to be in the style of a song from French opera and uh, sacred song at the time. There's a flute for uh, a piece for flute sounds, uh, a piece that's called a duo, which is for the tiers sounds or the, uh, the, the uh, partial sounds, and uh, a wonderful piece called the tiers en taille, which is like a big operatic lament, only because it's, and you can imagine it for a French countertenor singer, uh, only uh, it's got all kinds of runs in it because the keyboardist can do that uh, and turn it into a flashy keyboard piece and not just imitate the declamation of the French language. And then finally there's a big piece for the reed sounds.
that's a wide range of sound. We've hardly gotten out of the 1600s, have we? And uh, we hardly will. But that gives you a wide range of sound. You also noticed in all that French music a whole lot of busy, trilly, fluttery stuff. Remember that at that time in France, everybody who was listening to music like that uh, was wearing brocaded fancy clothes with lace ruffles and powdered wigs. And all of that fluttery, trilly stuff is, goes right along with all of that uh, fanciness. Uh, it's uh, very much a part of the personality of the time, or at least of the portion of people who uh, encountered that music in the time. Um, so, we don't have a whole lot of time left. I'd like to play you, I think, just one more piece, and it's going to be a total difference from what uh, you've had. This is a piece from the 20th century. by a man named Helmut Walker, who was a German, a great German organist of the 20th century, blind almost from birth, uh, noteworthy because he was the first person to record on disc the complete organ works of Johann Sebastian Bach. And in fact, Walker did that twice in his lifetime. Uh, he had a very uh, stable, uh, distinguished teaching career in Frankfurt and uh, he also wrote music, and because he had played all of the pieces of Bach, so many of which are based on hymn tunes, uh, Falke composed a great number of uh, organ pieces composed on, uh, based on hymn tunes as well. Uh, and so this is his version of a hymn that you know called A Mighty Fortress is Our God. That the original form of that hymn, you know, was not in the 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 uh, quite in the rhythm that we're used to it. It went bum 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 ba bum ba. That's what music was like in the early Reformation. Uh, I don't know whether the Lutheran Church began to get a little more serious as it got going. Uh, art art and architecture certainly changed so that light fluffy, gold filigreed altar pieces disappeared from Germany and were replaced by big, massive, heavy stone altars. Uh, along with that, and I've never found a colleague to discuss this with, um, all of the hymn tunes got squared off. So now it became dum, 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 bum, 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 ba, ba, bum, ba, very clear, one, two, three, four, instead of that wonderful swaying, bouncing rhythm. So there's a little bit of the other rhythm in this. Uh, you'll still recognize the tune, I think.
Thanks so much for coming. It's always so much fun for me to get to play these pieces. And I'm even getting used to not having you in the room or even seeing your faces in boxes when I do it. So, thanks again. Good evening.